Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that's of interest to many people, and that is intercultural activities and traveling. So we have an expert today on both of these topics. My guest today is Mark Walker. Mark Walker, a returned United States Peace Corps volunteer from Guatemala, is president of Million Mile Walker. His most recent book is My Saddest Pleasures. Mark Walker, welcome to today's Global Connections program. It's great to be here, Bill. Appreciate it. I appreciate you being with me. Thank you so much. Mark, we're going to get into your book. Well, books, I should say plural. But tell me a bit about Million Mile Walker. That's an interesting title. What exactly is your group? What is your organization about? Well, I after 45 years of traveling and working with different organizations like CARE, Plan International, Make-A-Wish, I decided this was a good time to start telling my stories. And uh, so I set up my own uh, writing platform. And that's what Million Mile Walker is. So people can go to millionmilewalker.com. They can find my articles. I have about 30 that have been published, about 70 reviews. They can see different videos that have been done. I have a uh, photo gallery on there. And I, and I have a section where they can sign up for my newsletter, the Million Mile Walker Dispatch. So this is my way of getting the word out. Uh, one of the things we'll talk about later on is how the publishing industry has changed. And one of the things that's changed the most is there's more influence on online technology. And, and really, you have to have an online presence and, in order to be a serious writer. Was it your time in Guatemala in the United States Peace Corps that sparked this interest in travel and intercultural learning and that type of thing? Or did you have definitely it started out as a Peace Corps volunteer in a place called Ishi Juan at uh, 10,000 feet. And I was doing uh, uh, fertilizer experience, but I was doing more than that. And eventually I met a lovely stra strawberry blonde Guatemalan called Ligia. And we got married and we've had three children. And I've worked on and off in Guatemala uh, for about eight or nine years. So Guatemala is key to my story. And really that was the focus of my first book, which is a memoir, Different Latitudes, My Life in the Peace Corps and Beyond. That was the first, uh, that was the first book that, that tells that particular story. We'll have to get together sometime and swap Peace Corps stories. Mine started with two years in the Dominican Republic. And then after that experience, I went to South America and hitchhiked for a year from Central and, well, Central and South America, came back and then was on an international path for the rest of my life. So Peace Corps has many positive ramifications. There's no doubt about it. So I'm glad to hear that. Well, you've had quite an extensive travel experience. What did you learn during the 50 years or so of traveling? Well, there are a couple of things. One is I had a close up and personal uh, look at, at what motivates families from Central America to abandon their homes, to leave their homes and head north to the United States. And I've also had an opportunity to take a look at a lot of the misinformation that relates to the issue of immigration from Central America. So that's that's been an issue that I've I've focused on and learned a lot. And I've written a number of articles about Guatemala over the years. And actually, I'm working, uh, finalizing my next book, which will be called A Guatemala Reader. You were talking about the out-migration from Guatemala and, and other Central American countries, El Salvador, Nicaragua, different ones there. What, what do you see as some of the misconceptions? Or I'm going to say misinformation. It's If you watch the the so-called news, which really on a large number of these networks, it's very little news and more, uh, I don't know, um, scary opinion to come right down to it. But if you watch Fox or some of these others, they paint a, somewhat of a different picture. What did, what did you learn <laughs> as far as- Well, there's a lot, of, a lot of focus on uh, misinformation, such as, um, you know, the, the, these are caravans that are coming uh, you know, from the north, and they're un, you know, uh, uh, record-breaking size, and the fact that they bring drugs, which is totally false. And of course, they're missing the most important premise 
it, it, which is immigration is what has built this country. And immigrants are bringing new skills and they will fill many of the gaps that exist within our existing economy. For example, there are a, a lot of ranchers, there are a lot of, uh, uh, of, of food processors, uh, certainly farmers who urgently need labor that these groups will provide. And they provide a lot more than just uh, you know, the, the unskilled labor, they also provide a lot of skilled, uh, skilled labor. And also these people represent a lot of different cultural, different aspects that they bring to our country, new languages, new information, uh, new innovation, and a lot of them set up their own businesses. So those are just a couple of things. That, and, and unfortunately, and, and uh, when you have 5 million uh, dreamers, I mean, these are, these are young kids that were brought here and they only speak English and still not to have defined what their future is and, and, and hold that, uh, the fear of possibly getting deported to a country they don't even know. It just goes to show how far we are behind as a country and defining this most important uh, resource that's available to us. And we, we're just caught in this constant regurgitation of misinformation and, and really hate talk about uh, you know, immigrant, immig immigrants. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point about the dreamers. It's been shown that the vast majority of them have never been in their country's origin or their, I should say their parents' origin, not theirs. Yeah. Many of them were either brought here or, or were born here or whatever the case might be. But it is, a, it's a very, very delicate situation. And you're talking about the industries. There are many industries in the United States, such as agriculture and California and Oh, meat packing and other industries like that that would have a hard time surviving without migrant labor. It would just not be able to, they would not be able to exist. But we could go off on, on immigration for days, I would imagine. But let's talk about your new book. It's, uh, you, you've described it, as, described it as the yin and yang of travel series. Tell, tell me about that. What is, what is the yin and yang of travel series? Well, that was inspired by Paul Thoreau's book, The Tao of Travel, in which he talks about uh, different uh, travel uh, stories and this sort of thing. So I've been writing some of my own. And he, he, he was talking about uh, uh, how travel and, and even some of the worst things that happen can really help you appreciate other countries and learn about other countries. So I've been I've written a, a series, my own series, the Yin and Yang, uh, which tells about different situations and of uh, different ways that we travel. For example, the way we travel alone, as you did and I did, for uh, in my case, uh, uh, fifteen thousand miles uh, over five and a half months, is a lot different from how I travel with my wife or my family. So I've written articles, essays about that. My latest one was Shifley's Epic Equestrian Ride. It won the award by uh, Solis for best travel writing. And that's about a teacher in Buenos Aires who finds two Creole horses and he rides them over a year, 10,000 miles from Buenos Aires to Washington, DC. So I come up alongside him based on the fact that we went to some of the same places, even though it was 35 years apart. And I share with him uh, my observations about the places that he went, especially when he start, stopped off in Guatemala. And my my wife's uh, uh, my father-in-law was actually had was a rancher, and he owned horses in Guatemala. So I share some of the differences and what horses mean to people, and how important they are to the culture, and that sort of thing. And that was my Shifley's epic equestrian ride article. Mm -hmm. And how does your current book, how does it differ from your first book, Different Latitudes? Well, to begin with, uh, my saddest pleasures, there it is. Now the photograph there, that's, uh, I'm on the Pan American Highway going up to my fertilizer experiments and those bags there, those are all mine. So that's my saddest pleasure. That was inspired by uh, Moritz Thompson's third book. Moritz Thompson wrote uh, The uh, Living Poor, which is really the best of all Return Peace, all Peace Corps experience books. And his book was The Saddest Pleasure. 
And uh, he found he came up with that title from a quote from Paul Thoreau, which was travel is the saddest of pleasures, it gave me eyes. So this book is a reflection on my 50 years of travel miscalculations and disasters. And what could go wrong? And of course, it's always those stories which we remember the most. And I was, in, and I, I've, I was inspired enough by Moritz and impressed by the fact that, that great authors like Paul Thoreau and Tom Miller, who wrote the um, Panama Hat Trail, were influenced by him and wrote about him. So I've put, I'm putting together an, an anthology of essays, my own and others, about Moritz. It'll be called Moritz Thompson, the best American writer nobody knows about. When we come back in just a moment, we're going to talk about what could go wrong, and many things can when you're traveling. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you have a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our shows and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're talking about intercultural experiences and travel, and most of it internationally. And my guest is an expert on these topics. My guest today is Mr. Mark Walker, a returned United States Peace Corps volunteer from Guatemala, who is president of Million Mile Walker. His most recent book is My Saddest Pleasures. Mark, as, as veterans of, of the, the thumb, the hitchhiking thumb, I guess, we can, we can attest to a lot of things can go wrong when you least expect them. What uh, what is one of your most memorable experiences? We could we could spend hours on them, but we can only get in one probably. Okay, this is one where I took a group of Rotarians up to the highest lake in the world, Lake Titicaca, at twelve thousand five hundred feet, and so I've got fifteen Rotarians, and this is what uh, this is some of the unexpected things that happens. Touring on the Bolivian side of the lake, we all were suffering from some degree of altitude sickness. So we stopped at a restaurant for some refreshments. I happened to look at the television that was on and I thought, oh shit, what are all those troops and tanks doing in La Paz? Isn't that the same road we, road we were just on? This is all I need. I had gotten these folks up here and now I feared I wouldn't be able to get them out. I knew enough about La Paz to realize that the highway to the airport went through a working class community of El Alto. And when the inhabitants got upset about something and negatively impacted their community, and they staged a protest, the troops moved in right away and all hell would break loose. It's not like you, it's, it's not like you have an alternative route. There wasn't one. This was the end of the line, no airport, just a slow canoe across the majestic lake to the other side which was Peru. What now? I glanced around the tour members room looking for help and spotted Ed Kaur, MAP International board member and friend for many tours that we had shared. Ed taught at the International Program Center at the University of, Air of Oklahoma and he was also a former college wrestling champ and Marine. He'd had a long career in the foreign service and served as ambassadors to Bolivia, El Salvador and Peru and was an anti-terrorist expert. He would know what to do. I worked my way across the room, weaving through the crowd who had no idea of our trouble and pulled Ed aside. I whispered to him that my concern was and that we were trapped in Lake Titicaca unless we figured out an escape route. Ed offered to call the US ambassador to find out about the current situation and discuss our options. He stepped aside outside, made the call, he came back, he shook his head. He looked concerned. David said under no circumstances returned to La Paz with a busload of gringos. He said we had to wait it out. I nodded, but I knew we couldn't wait. I had to get this group to La Paz in two days for their departure. We got through all our tour company in La Paz, and as luck would have it, they had an office in Lima. Saved. 
I called my contact. So Alvaro, I said, looks like we're stuck up here the, for the duration and our plane departs from the pass in a few days. What would our plan B look like? Alvaro simply said, give me a few hours. We might have to divert the group through Peru. And that's precisely what transpired. The next day we skipped across the lake, Lake Titicaca on a hydroplane, landed in Puno, Peru, spent the night in Arequipa and then went on to Lima. And I'm glad to say that I talked to all the participants, uh, Bill, all the Rotarians, and every one of them thought that this is the way we would planned the trip. So we were able to leave safely from Lima as opposed to La Paz, and nobody was the wiser. <laughs> but it could have been a major disaster. It certainly could have been. The one term that you all always want to incorporate when you're traveling is flexibility. You've got to be flexible because who knows what will happen next. I won't go into detail, but I remember my trip across Lake Titicaca on being on one side of the lake watching my gear on the back of a big dump truck on a flat raft that was rocking and rolling with the waves. And it looked like it was just going to flip into Lake Titicaca in any minute. And this was on a calm day, but it is, uh, we'll, we'll have to share experiences at some time. Well, Mark, Definitely. before we run out of time, I know you're a scholar and an accomplished author, but you have strong, well, you've been very involved with various writing groups, and one is called PEN, P-E-N. What, what exactly is this group, and why are you involved with them? Well, PEN, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, PEN America is... Uh, they're celebrating their their hundredth anniversary. They represent seventy five writers in the country, and they're the largest of one hundred centers around the world. So it's an international group, and they're expanding into ten u s. cities. And the reason they are is because they are we're 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 seeing an an amazing amount of book banning in this country. Mm. And people forget Hitler was one of the great book burners. And he said, we need to eliminate our artists and writers. And those of you who have read history know what, the, what that ominous uh, uh, threat can, can lead to. So with the recent stabbing of Salman uh, Rushdie, and, uh, Rushdie and the unprecedented physical threats against writers, I think this is one of the most important uh, issues that, that we need to focus on. So the American, for example, the American Library Association says that just within the last six months, 330 cases of book banning attempts have been, uh, have, have been uh, uh, recorded. So this is, you know, this is a, a big issue. I just wanna share a few words, one example of this from uh, an article that I wrote for, uh, on, on book banning here in Arizona. I received uh, something from one of my siblings. It said Paradise Valley United School District in Arizona is concerned about math book, uh, textbooks that claim conservatives are racist and sexual, uh, you know, biased uh, uh, oriented material. It just so happens the school that they were focusing on was where my, two of my three kids went to school. So I checked with them and they told me two things. First off, dad, if kids are looking for pornographic information, they're going to the website, they're not going to the textbook. Secondly, we've never had any issues with uh, textbooks whatsoever. And the group that was making this uh, assertion, uh, Parents Defending Education, they were doing this as part of a fundraiser and none of their information was collaborated. So you've gotta be careful. I prefer to look towards people like J Jason Reynolds He's the ambassador for youth literature. And he says the focus needs to be on the children and not the parents. And books should be the basis for discovery. And if one feeling uncomfortable from negative things that have happened in our history over the years is not an excuse not to teach that history. So those are some of the issues of, of, of book banning. So I've been part of this group. We, we now have a chapter. We've had two meetings in which we brought together authors and poets, and they talked about, uh, they actually recited some of the books that are being, trying to be banned here in Arizona. And uh, we also had a senator, a state senator, Christine Marsh with us. She's been at two of our last meetings, and she was the, the uh, 
public teacher of the year. So she knows a few things about books. So the, the, the last statement I wanna make or comment I wanna make on this bill is that a lot of the books that are being attempted to ban, 50% are teen books or you know, youth books. And uh, for example, uh, uh, Potter, uh, uh, you know, Harry Potter, that was banned for four years because they said it was satanic. So for that reason, the latest review that, that I wrote was on a book called All Boys Aren't Blue, a memoir manifesto about growing up black and queer by George Johnson. So I think that these books are important and it's important for us to understand what the books are, why people are trying to have them banned. Now I found this particular book interesting because it so happens the author who's black and queer was went to the same uh, community that I did, Plainfield, New Jersey. And we went to the same elementary school, but there were 40 years between us and a lot of differences between my experience and his experience, which he talks about in this book. So that's a little bit about Penn. Pen, you go to pen.org. That's the name of the organization. And this is just one of my reviews, but this is the reason why I like book reviews because it shows and reflects some of the the uh, issues uh, facing us in our society today. Yes, and as you mentioned, you go to, our viewers can go to www.pen.org for more information on this. As you were going through that, Mark, I was thinking of a litany of, I guess, our pile of evidence that's been coming online about various attempts to ban books, to change textbooks, and, and in the United States, uh, it, the biggest offenders appear to be in the state of Florida, Virginia, Texas, and a few others. And overseas, of course, we got our buddy Urban in Hungary. And I don't know about Bolsonaro in Brazil. He was he was he had done so many things. I'm not sure about the book banning, but anyway, <laughs> this is a serious problem, and it's one that we certainly need to pay attention to and be involved in it. Because who decides which books will or will not be kept? That's the question. And I don't want somebody deciding who's going, what I'm going to read and I'm not going to decide what they're going to read. So it's extremely important that we get involved. Well, Mark, we're down to our last minute or so. Let me just ask you in passing or in closing, what, why do you think it's so important for us uh, to learn more about things like international travel, to learn about other cultures, to perhaps study foreign languages, to meet people from other parts of the world, to broaden our horizons, and to develop, to develop more of our own int, intrapersonal and interpersonal educational components as we advance through life. Well, Bill, I'm a big proponent of Mark Twain's quip, travel is fatal to bigotry and narrow-mindedness. I think that's key. Another great, uh, a, a great quote about travel that I adhere to and believe in, to travel is to discover that everyone is wrong about other countries. And I've spent a lot of time uh, traveling to places and coming back and explaining to people some of the nuances and the beautiful things that go on in these countries and things that we could actually learn from them as well. And of course, my wife and I have been big proponents. We got all three of our children in Rotary Youth Exchange. Everybody speaks uh, at least one or two different languages. My oldest, uh, my youngest son is a judge. My middle daughter has uh, been with International Rescue Committee for uh, 17 years working with refugees. Uh, and my oldest is a professional simultaneous translator. And my wife is a bilingual teacher. So we've put that knowledge and that belief and in, in, it's really reflected in who we are and we think that this really is, uh, this is something the world needs a lot more of this sort of interaction. We're watching the World Cup now. And uh, it's so, it's fabulous to see these other countries actually coming together. And for the first time, an African country is in the finals. Uh, just a lot of things, interesting things are changing in the world. Some uh, positive, but a lot of them are really negative. The amount, the number of uh, refugees is, is greater than ever, and we're gonna to have to deal with these millions and millions of people that have been forced out of their homes because of violence, basically. Yes, well, Mark, the next time we meet, we'll have to talk about our travels and also 
I talk about Rotary International, one of the largest service groups in the world with 1.2 million members and the great work that it's done in teaming up with the United Nations to eliminate polio and other problems in this world, as well as the great work it does in individual communities and in 35,000 clubs around the world. So that'll have to wait. But Mark Walker, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be with you again. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.